For this lecture set, we're going to start talking about groups, and this subset is specifically about what is a group. So a group is something that consists of two or more people who interact and are interdependent in the sense that their needs and goals cause them to influence each other. So when we talk about this, we mean that groups are oftentimes tied by some central cause or theme, and the members of the group tend to work together for a specific outcome. In the same way, just because you have a large set of people together does not necessarily make them a group. So all of the people at a university, for example, would not be called a group because they all have different types of goals and needs and are not interdependent on each, excuse me, on each other. Just like all the people at a public sports game are not technically a group, we would actually call them a crowd because again, they are not interdependent in regard to their goals and needs. Also, just as a side note, if you hear lots of weird sounds, it is because they have construction around where I am recording this and I'm unable to tell them to stop for the moment. Okay, so why do people join groups? There are a bunch of reasons for why this happens, and one of the primary ones is actually thought to be rooted in evolutionary theory, and this has to do with the fact that our ancestors were just better able to survive when they functioned as groups as opposed to individuals, and those members were more likely to pass on their genes. And the idea being here that things like hunting or gathering or agriculture or caring for children or defending a group is easier to do when you have groups to do it and to split up and divide the way in which this is managed, as opposed to trying to do all of these things by yourself. Now, another way that supports or another reason that we use to support the idea that this is evolutionary rooted is that people from all cultures tend to form groups. While it is possible to have members here and there within cultures who run as individuals, this is a relatively new phenomena as far as sort of historical precedent goes, because most people were not actually able to survive by themselves in olden times, whereas nowadays with supermarkets and cars and computers, this is more common, I suppose. But at the end of the day, you find the tendency to form groups and sort of relationships common across all cultures. Other reasons that people tend to form groups that are more on the social aspect are that joining groups allows us to feel distinctive because when we are part of some groups, it implies that we're not part of other groups. So for example, to be part of a rich person's group implies that you are not part of a poor person's group and that can oftentimes make people feel distinctive. Another reason people tend to join groups is it helps them define who they are. So for example, a scientist who joins a group on open science and publication, they might allow themselves to define themselves as a good researcher because they're part of a group that is considered to be part of a institution that does good research. Now, on average, group sizes tend to be between three and six members. It is occasionally that you'll have group sizes of two. These are often referred to as dyads, and it is possible to have groups that are quite a bit larger than six members. But on average, this is about the range that you see for most groups between social ones and specific task oriented groups. Now, when groups become too large, it is no longer possible for all members to interact with one another and oftentimes they then tend to lose their common and interdependent goals. And this can ultimately then result in either the dissolution of a larger group or the creation of smaller subgroups within that existing once upon a time group. And a way to think about this would be, even though you have many people in one big company, they are not necessarily considered a group because they could all be vying for the same overall funding structure and they all have to sort of vie and jockey for who will get what portion of that funding. Um, you could imagine production versus marketing versus advertising versus patent versus HR and so on and so forth. Just like societies, they are also norms that are specific to groups and these just refer to sort of acceptable behavior that members of groups are expected to follow and as an individual, you could be a member of several different groups, and each of those groups are likely to have their own specific types of norms, even though those norms can overlap, depending on the types of groups to which you are a member. Now, if one does not 
comply with the norms of a group. Oftentimes this can result in ridicule or teasing or even bullying behavior. And if one continues to sort of deny the norms of a group and not act in line with them, it is fairly common for expulsion from the group to be the result. Now, it doesn't happen so much because generally speaking, people are very averse to being excluded from a group that they were once a member of. And so people will go to great lengths to avoid being kicked out of a group. And this is where you can see people take part in all kinds of self detrimental behaviors because they will go to great lengths to be well to preserve their group membership. There are also social roles in groups and social roles are just the shared expectations in a group of how particular people are supposed to behave. One of the probably most obvious of this in a college campus is if you think of college clubs, they are specific roles. There is a club president and a vice president and a treasury person and a marketing person and so on and so forth. And this can even happen in sort of uh, personal groups in which you just have friends together, where oftentimes you will have sort of different types of personalities that come together. And there can oftentimes be friction when there are too many of one personality type as opposed to not in certain types of social groups. And so many groups that exist, both just purely social groups and groups that are for some kind of productive task will tend to have social rules and a lot of times roles or groups that have these roles that are clearly defined will have members who are pretty satisfied, happy, and will perform quite well. Even though our general intuition or stereotype, I guess, oftentimes is that we don't like to be told what our positions are. For the most part, a lot of human beings actually function well when their roles are clearly defined. It is, however, possible for these roles to go too far. Now, one of the most famous examples of this is the Stanford Prison Experiment. It's otherwise known as the Zimbardo Prison Experiment. This was conducted about 40, 50 years ago now. And the way this worked is a group of college students were brought into the psych building. They had built a mock prison in the basement. With the flip of a coin, they were either determined to be prison guards or prisoners. And they were either given uniforms to make them look like security officers, or they were given basically a small smock and some slippers and were chained up in their, well, they were had one chain put around their ankles. And they were then played the sort of game, I shouldn't call it a game because it became very serious, of prisoners. And they wanted to see how people would adopt these roles. And it became so extreme that within six days, they had to terminate this experiment that was originally slated to last for two full weeks. And the manner in which it became extreme is, even though no physical violence was permitted, there was an incredible amount of bullying and ultimately what we would define today as psychological torture on part of these mock prison guards towards the mock prisoners. And even though everybody knew that this was something that was being conducted for a psychology experiment, the number of people who suffered from trauma, anxiety, and depression among the prisoners was quite incredible. In fact, they were people who had to leave even before the six days were over. And the prison guards themselves also tended to just exacerbate this type of phenomenon. And we'll later in this lecture talk about group polarization, and this explains some of why these phenomena happen. So while on average, social roles can be very beneficial to a group, they can oftentimes lead us astray as well. This is something that is fairly commonly seen in prison environments or very highly competitive situations with strong hierarchies. When it comes to group cohesiveness, this refers to qualities of a group that bind the members together and ultimately promote liking between them. And this strongly influences how well the groups will function and perform. Now, here there are some strong differences between groups that are primarily for social purposes versus groups that are designed or built to solve problems. So when it comes to groups that are built or organized around social purposes, the higher the group cohesiveness, the better. Uh, maybe not for people not in the group themselves, but for those members who are of the group, this tends to be the case where the more the individual members like each other and all fit or jive together, the better it is for their overall well-being. 
Now, when it comes to groups that are built to solve some type of problems, especially complex problems, a high degree of group cohesiveness can actually be detrimental to finding solutions or at least good solutions for those types of problems. And we will later on talk about groupthink, and this is one of the biggest detrimental factors that can arise from highly cohesive groups trying to make decisions about complex problems. There is a caveat here. If there are types of problems that simply require a large degree of cooperation or synchronized behavior, then once again, the more cohesive a group is, is better. So for example, a cheer squad or something to that effect, here, even though they're doing very really complex tasks with all the various different movements and synchronization that is required, when you're trying to do a task like that, oftentimes the higher the cohesiveness within the group, the better. When it comes to diversity, overall, the average of most groups tend to be fairly homogenous. And this is not just necessarily in terms of factors like race and ethnicity or gender, but even in styles of personality or clothing or general preferences, you tend to find groups that are fairly homogenous. And this is largely due to the fact that groups themselves operate in ways that encourage their members to operate in homogenous ways. Right? Oftentimes when people join groups, they join them for some specific task, and that task then reinforces a certain type of methodology or personality or just sort of general operating procedure. And this sort of goes in line with the fact that many groups oftentimes attract like-minded individuals. Someone who doesn't really like to play chess is oftentimes not going to join a chess club. Now, that being said, there are some tremendous benefits of having diverse groups over homogenous ones, especially in the domain of solving problems. Now, an interesting set of studies was conducted by McLeod, Lobel, and Cox, and the paper is called Ethnic Diversity and Creativity in Small Groups. And so here, 135 undergraduates, and in this case, they were 79 European Americans, 20 African Americans, 22 Asian Americans, and 17 Latinx identifying undergraduates. These were, these people were taken and split into two types of groups. These groups on average consisted of four members each. So you had homogenous groups that consisted entirely of European American participants and heterogeneous groups in which you had one of each of the above ethnicities represented. Now, each of these groups was given the task of what they referred to as the tourist problem. And so they were to spend 15 minutes collectively coming up with as many ways as possible to attract more tourists to the United States of America. After this, all of their ideas were first coded for checking for duplicates and duplicates were removed. And then two judges, people who were not involved in the experiment, were asked to rate all of these ideas in terms of how effective they were on a scale of one to five and also how feasible they were also again on a scale of one to five. And this level of agreement that you're seeing here is just how likely the two judges oftentimes had ratings within one point of each other. And so you can see there was fairly high agreement across all ideas for both of these judges. Participants also indicated by self-report how much they liked the group that they were involved in. And so the results here you can see are both for feasibility and for effectiveness, the heterogeneous groups made significantly more effective and feasible suggestions for attracting more tourists to the United States than did the homogenous groups. Now, if you look at the mean differences for the liking, for example, you will find that the heterogeneous groups tended to like each other a little bit less than the homogenous groups. However, this difference was not actually significant. Here's just some real life data to show this. This is a paper from Herring in 2009 and is titled, Does Diversity Pay? Uh, just a, for a quick thing that the companies used in this metric were controlled for size, age, location, and type of industry. And this just means that the statistical contribution to the variance that these factors had was removed from the overall model. The thing I would like to draw your attention to in this case is the average sales in millions of dollars. And here, for the first three columns along racial diversity, you can see that companies that had less than 10% of their workforce as consisting of some kind of diversity identifying individuals made average sales in millions of dollars of 51.9 million per year on average. 
Whereas if you increase the level of diversity from 10 to 24%, this goes all the way up to $383.8 million a year. And if you increase it beyond the 25% factor, that average sale revenue goes all the way up to $761 million. This is an unbelievable increase in overall sales based on how diversity at a racial level is changing. And again, remember, this is controlled for size, age of the company, the location of the company, and the type of industry. You see a very similar trend as you increase the gender diversity levels. Of course, these factors are slightly higher in terms of overall degree of diversity, but nonetheless, you see the same pattern happen, which is pretty wild if you think about it, because oftentimes much of the reasoning behind whether we should have high degrees or representative diversity or not is often talked about in terms of morality. And this is sort of hard capitalistic evidence for why that would be a good idea. Finally, some people have argued, like was mentioned in the paper looking at the tourist problem, that it can be detrimental to the overall liking of groups when they are highly diverse and that this reduction in liking can reduce overall morale. But research has indicated that any threats to morale and liking posed by diverse groups actually tend to not be very long lasting and reduce over time. And in fact, given enough time, these diverse groups will tend to take great pride in their diversity, and this actually will increase morale over time.